Chapter Six of A Popular History of Ireland, Book Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joan Freeman. A Popular History of Ireland, from the Earliest Period to the Emancipation of the Catholics, Book Two, by Thomas Darcy McGee. Chapter Six, Brian Ardry. Battle of Clontarf. By the deposition of Malachy II and the transfer of supreme power to the long excluded line of Heber, Brian completed the revolution which time had wrought in the ancient Celtic constitution. He threw open the sovereignty to every great family as a prize to be won by policy or force, and no longer an inheritance to be determined by usage and law. The consequences were what might have been expected. After his death, the O'Connors of the West competed with both O'Neills and O'Briens for supremacy, and a chronic civil war prepared the path for Strongbow and the Normans. The term "kings with opposition" is applied to nearly all who reigned between Brian's time and Roderick O'Connor's, meaning thereby kings who were unable to secure general obedience to their administration of affairs. During the remainder of his life. Brian wielded with accustomed vigor the supreme power. The High Niles were, of course, his chief difficulty. In the year 1002, we find him at Ballysader in Sligo, challenging their obedience. In 1004, we find him at Armagh, offering twenty ounces of gold on Patrick's altar, staying a week there and receiving hostages. In 1005, he marched through Canoe, crossed the River Erne at Ballyshannon proceeded through Terconal and Tyrowen, crossed the Ban into Antrim, and returned through Down and Dundalk, about Lamas, to Tara. In this and the two succeeding years, by taking similar circuits, he subdued Ulster without any pitched battle, and caused his authority to be feared and obeyed nearly as much at the giant's causeway as at the bridge of Athlone. In his own house of Kinkora, Brian entertained at Christmas three thousand guests, including the Danish lords of Dublin and Man, the fugitive Earl of Kent, the young King of Scots, certain Welsh princes, and those of Munster, Ulster, Leinster, and Canoe, besides his hostages. At the same time, Malachy, with the shadow of independence, kept his unfrequented court in Westmeath, amusing himself with wine and chess and the taming of unmanageable horses, in which last pursuit, after his abdication, we hear of his breaking a limb. To support the hospitalities of Kinkora, the tributes of every province were rendered in kind at his gate on the first day of November. Connote sent eight hundred cows and eight hundred hogs, Ulster alone five hundred cows and as many hogs, and sixty loads of iron. Leinster, three hundred bullocks, three hundred hogs, and three hundred loads of iron. Ossory, Desmond, and the smaller territories, in proportion. The Danes of Dublin, one hundred fifty pipes of wine, and the Danes of Limerick, three hundred sixty-five of red wine. The Dalcasians, his own people, were exempt from all tribute and taxation, while the rest of Ireland was thus catering for Kinkora. The lyric poets in then nature courtiers and given to enjoyment, flocked of course to this bountiful palace. The harp was seldom silent night or day. The strains of panegyric were as prodigal and incessant as the falling of the Shannon over Killaloe. Among these eulogiums none is better known than that beautiful allegory of the poet MacLeag, who sung that a young lady of great beauty, adorned with jewels and costly dress, might perform unmolested a journey on foot through the island, carrying a straight wand on the top of which might be a ring of great value. The name of Brian was thus celebrated as in itself a sufficient protection of life, chastity, and property in every corner of the island. Not only the poets, but the more exact and simple analysts applaud Brian's administration of the laws and his personal virtues. He labored hard to restore the Christian civilization so much defaced by two centuries of pagan warfare. To facilitate the execution of the laws, he enacted the general use of surnames, 
obliging the clans to take the name of a common ancestor, with the addition of Mac or O, words which signify of or son of a forefather. Thus the northern High Niles divided into O'Neills, O'Donnells, McLaughlins, etc. The Sil Murray took the name of O'Connor, and Brian's own posterity became known as O'Brien's. To justice he added munificence, and of this the churches and schools of the entire island were the recipients. Many a desolate shrine he adorned, many a bleak chancel he hung with lamps, many a long silent tower had its bells restored. Monasteries were rebuilt, and the praise of God was kept up perpetually by a devoted brotherhood. Roads and bridges were repaired, and several strong stone fortresses were erected to command the passes of lakes and rivers. The vulnerable points along the Shannon and the Sewer, and the lakes as far north as the Foyle, were secured by forts of clay and stone. Thirteen royal houses in Munster alone are said to have been by him restored to their original uses. What increases our respect for the wisdom and energy thus displayed is the fact that the author of so many improvements enjoyed but five short years of peace after his accession to the monarchy. His administrative genius must have been great when, after a long life of warfare, he could apply himself to so many works of internal improvement and external defense. In the five years of peace just spoken of, from 1005 to 1010, Brian lost by death his second wife, a son called Donald, and his brother Marken, called in the annals head of the clergy of Munster. Hugh, the son of Mahon, also died about the same period. His favorite son and heir, Moreau, was left, and Moreau had, at this time, several children. Other sons and daughters were also left him, by each of his wives, so that there was every prospect that the posterity for whom he had so long sought the sovereignty of Ireland would continue to possess it for countless generations. But God disposes of what man only proposes. The Northmen had never yet abandoned any soil on which they had once set foot, and the policy of conciliation which the veteran king adopted in his old age was not likely to disarm men of their stamp. Every intelligence of the achievements of their race in other realms stimulated them to new exertions and shamed them out of peaceful submission. Rollo and his successors had, within Brian's lifetime, founded in France the great dukedom of Normandy, while Swain had swept irresistibly over England and Wales and prepared the way for a Danish dynasty. Pride and shame alike appealed to their warlike compatriots not to allow the fertile Hibernia to slip from their grasp, and the great age of its long-dreaded king seemed to promise them an easier victory than heretofore was possible. In 1012 we find Brian at Laufoyle repelling a new Danish invasion and giving freedom to Patrick's churches. The same year, an army under Moreau and another under Malachy was similarly engaged in Leinster and Meath, the former carrying his arms to Kilmanham on the south side of Dublin, the other to Howth on the north. In this year also the Gentiles, or pagan Northmen, made a descent on Cork and burned the city, but were driven off by the neighboring chiefs. The great event, however, of the long war which had now been waged for full two hundred years between the men of Erin and the men of Scandinavia was approaching. What may fairly be called the last field day of Christianity and paganism on Irish soil was near at hand. A taunt thrown out over a game of chess at Kincora is said to have hastened this memorable day. Melmura, Prince of Leinster, playing or advising on the game, made or recommended a false move upon which Moreau, son of Brian, observed it was no wonder his friends, the Danes, to whom he owed his elevation, were beaten at Glenmama, if he gave them advice like that. Melmura, highly incensed by this allusion, all the more severe for its bitter truth, arose, ordered his horse, and rode away in haste. Brian, when he heard it, dispatched a messenger after the indignant guest, begging him to return, but Melmura was not to be pacified, and refused. 
we next hear of him as concerting with certain Danish agents. Always open to such negotiations, those measures which led to the great invasion of the year 1014, in which the whole Scanian race, from Anglicia to Man, north to Norway, bore an active share. Brian, when he heard it, despatched a messenger after the indignant guest, begging him to return, but Melmura was not to be pacified, and refused. We next hear of him as concerting with certain Danish agents, always open to such negotiations, those measures which led to the great invasion of the year 1014, in which the whole Scanian race, from Anglicia to Man, north to Norway, bore an active share. These agents, passing over to England and Man, among the Scottish Isles, and even to the Baltic, followed up the design of an invasion on a gigantic scale. Swibney, Earl of Man, entered warmly into the conspiracy, and sent the war arrow through all those out-islands which obeyed him as lord. A yet more formidable potentate, Sigurd of the Orkneys, next joined the League. He was the fourteenth Earl of Orkney of Norse origin, and his power was, at this period, a balance to that of his nearest neighbor, the King of Scots. He had ruled since the year 996, not only over the Orkneys, Shetland, and northern Hebrides, but the coasts of Caithness and Sutherland, and even Ross and Moray rendered him homage and tribute. Eight years before the Battle of Clontarf, Malcolm II of Scotland, had been feigned to purchase his alliance by giving him his daughter in marriage, and the kings of Denmark and Norway treated with him on equal terms. The hundred inhabited isles which lie between Yell and Man, isles which after their conversion contained three hundred churches and chapels, sent in their contingents to swell the following of the renowned Earl Sigurd. As his fleet bore southward from Kirkwall, it swept the subject coast of Scotland, and gathered from every lough its galleys and its fighting men. The rendezvous was the Isle of Man, where Subni had placed his own forces under the command of Brodar, or Broderick, a famous leader against the Britons of Wales and Cornwall. In conjunction with Sigurd, the Manx men sailed over to Ireland, where they were joined in the Liffey by Karl Knutsen, Prince of Denmark, at the head of fourteen hundred champions clad in armor. Citric of Dublin stood or affected to stand neutral in these preparations, but Malmura of Leinster had mustered all the forces he could command for such an expedition. He was himself the head of the powerful family of O'Byrne, and was followed in his alliances by others of the descendants of Cahir Moore. O'Noland and O'More, with a truer sense of duty, fought on the patriotic side. Brian had not been ignorant of the exertions which were made during the summer and winter of the year 1013 to combine an overwhelming force against him. In his exertions to meet force with force, it is gratifying to every believer in human excellence to find him actively supported by the prince whom he had so recently deposed. Malachy, during the summer of 1013, had, indeed, lost two sons in skirmishes with Sitrick and Melmura, and had, therefore, his own personal wrongs to avenge. But he cordially cooperated with Brian before those occurrences and now loyally seconded it all his movements. The lords of the southern half-kingdom, the lords of Desis, Fermoy, Inchikin, Corkabaskin, Kinomiki, Kerry, and the lords of Hymeni and Hyfushera in Kono hastened to his standard. O'More and O'Nolan of Leinster and Donald, steward of Mar, in Scotland, were the other chieftains who joined him before Clontarf, besides those of his own kindred. None of the northern Hynail took part in the battle. They had submitted to Brian, but they never cordially supported him. Clontarf, the lawn or meadow of bulls, stretches along the crescent-shaped north strand of Dublin Harbor, from the ancient salmon weir at Ballybow Bridge, toward the promontory of Howth. Both horns of the crescent were held by the enemy, and communicated with his ships. The inland point terminating in the roofs of Dublin and the seaward marked by the lion-like head of Howth. 
The meadowland between sloped gently upward and inward from the beach, and for the myriad duels which formed the ancient battle, no field could present less positive vantage ground to combatants on either side. The invading force had possession of both wings, so that Bryan's army, which had first encamped at Kilmenham, must have crossed the Liffey for higher up, and marched round by the present Drumcondra in order to reach the appointed field. The day seems to have been decided on by formal challenge, for we are told Bryan did not wish to fight in the last week of Lent, but a pagan oracle having assured victory to Brodar, one of the northern leaders, if he engaged on a Friday, the invaders insisted on being led to battle on that day. And it so happened that, of all Fridays in the year, it fell on the Friday before Easter, that awful anniversary when the altars of the church are veiled throughout Christendom, and the dark stone is rolled to the door of the mystic sepulchre. The forces on both sides could not have fallen short of twenty thousand men. Under Karl Knutsen fought the ten hundred in armor, as they are called in the Irish annals, or the fourteen hundred, as they are called in northern chronicles. Under Brodar, the Manxmen and the Danes of Anglesea and Wales. Under Sigurd, the men of Orkney and its dependencies. Under Melmura of Leinster, his own tribe and their kinsmen of Offaly and Cullen, the modern Kildare and Wicklow. Under Brian's son Moreau were the tribes of Munster. Under the command of Malachy, those of Meath, under the lord of Hymeny, the men of Cano, and the steward of Mar had also his command. The engagement was to commence with the morning, so that as soon as it was day, Brian, crucifix in hand, harangued his army. On this day Christ died for you, was the spirit-stirring appeal of the venerable Christian king. At the entreaty of his friends, after this review, he retired to his tent, which stood at some distance, and was guarded by three of his aides. Here he alternately prostrated himself before the crucifix, or looked out from the tent door upon the dreadful scene that lay beyond. The sun rose to the zenith, and took his way towards the west, but still the roar of the battle did not abate. Sometimes, as their right hands swelled with the sword-hilts, well-known warriors might be seen falling back to bathe them in a neighboring spring, and then rushing again into the melee. The line of the engagement extended from the salmon weir towards Houth not less than a couple of miles, so that it was impossible to take in at a glance the probabilities of victory. Once, during the heat of the day, one of his servants said to Brian, A vast multitude are moving toward us. "'What sort of people are they?' inquired Brian. "'They are green naked people,' said the attendant. "'Oh,' replied the king, "'they are the Danes in armor. "'The utmost fury was displayed on all sides. "'Sigurd, Earl of Orkney, fell by Thurlow, grandson of Brian, "'and Enrud, one of the captains of the men in armor, "'by the hand of his father, Moreau. "'But both father and son perished in the dreadful conflict.' Melmura of Leinster, with his lords, fell on one side, and Conning, nephew of Brian, O'Kelly, O'Hane, and the steward of Mar, on the other. Hardly a nobly born man escaped, or sought to escape. The ten hundred in armor, and three thousand others of the enemy, with about an equal number of the men of Ireland, lay dead upon the field. One division of the enemy were, toward sunset, retreating to their ships, when Brodar, the Viking, perceiving the tent of Brian, standing apart, without a guard, and the aged king on his knees before the crucifix, rushed in, cut him down with a single blow, and then continued his flight. But he was overtaken by the guard and dispatched by the most cruel death they could devise. Thus, on the field of battle, in the act of prayer, on the day of our Lord's crucifixion, fell the Christian king in the cause of native land and holy cross. Many elegies have been dedicated to his memory, and not the least noble of these strains belong to his enemies. In death as in life he was still Brian of the Tributes. The deceased hero took his place at once in history, national and foreign. On hearing of his death, Melmura, Archbishop of Armagh, came with his clergy to swords in Meath, and conducted the body to Armagh, where, with his son and nephew, and the lord of Desis, he was solemnly interred in a new tomb. 
the fame of the event went out through all nations. The chronicles of Wales, of Scotland, and of Man, the annals of Adamar and Marianus, the sagas of Denmark and the Isles all record the event. In the orcades of Thermodus, Torpheus, a wail over the defeat of the Islesmen is heard, which they call Orkney's Woe and Randvar's Bane. The Norse settlers in Caithness saw terrific visions of Valhalla the day after the battle. In the Niala saga, a Norwegian prince is introduced as asking after his men, and the answer is, they were all killed. Malcolm of Scotland rejoiced in the defeat and death of his dangerous and implacable neighbor. Brian's battle, as it is called in the sagas, was, in short, such a defeat as prevented any general northern combination for the subsequent invasion of Ireland. Not that the country was entirely free from their attacks till the end of the eleventh century, but from the day of Clontarf forward, the long-cherished northern idea of a conquest of Ireland seems to have been gloomily abandoned by that indomitable people. End of chapter 6